Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's installment of the Reorg webinar series. We'll get started shortly. For those who have just joined us, thank you and welcome. My name is Shasha Dai. I'm a managing editor of Reorg. I lead our China coverage as part of the Asia Core credit team. The Chinese high yield market is different than the other Asian markets. And a key difference is that the Chinese market has a very strong and unique regulatory and policy overlay. The government is the exact opposite of the proverbial invisible hand. Nothing illustrates this more clearly than what's happened since the second week of November when a series of new direct, uh, directives, policies, and announcements came from various government agencies. The market reacted immediately and strongly. Bonds rallied, shares rebounded, and investors took action. Helping us dissect the new policy landscape are two of my colleagues that I've had the great pleasure of working with every day. Catherine Shi is, uh, is our China editor and Anna Zhang is our senior China reporter. Both Catherine and Anna have been covering the market for some time, a well-versed in all the major credits have broken some of the most important and market-moving scoops. Welcome, Catherine and Anna. Before I hand it over to them, just a quick reminder that a replay of today's webinar with slides will be available on the Rework webinar and podcast page within 24 hours for Rework subscribers. And please submit questions at any time during the presentation by using the Q&A widget located at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, let's get started. So the way the webinar is going to go today is that Catherine will first walk us through recent stimulus policies. Anna will then talk about how the policies affected certain real estate companies and how the market reacted. Catherine will then discuss implications for investors and what to look out for in the near future. With that, Catherine, take it away. <clears throat> Thanks, Shasha. Um, hi everyone, my name is Catherine Shu and I'm the editor for the China team. Um, so I'm going to first talk about the stimulus policy um, regarding the property sector. So first, um, we've seen that um, regulators have put out the three arrows um, for uh, the property market. And um, the first arrow, which refers to the loan quotas, um, we've seen that commercial banks and the state-owned banks have been providing loan quotas um, to performing credits, um, such as one Kuala Lumpur Country Garden, um, and also for developers who have already extended their onshore or offshore debt, um, such as Power Loan and CFI. Uh, well, for the second arrow, which refers to the new onshore debt assurance, um, we've seen that developers have obtained new MTN issuance quota um, with the 100% guarantee from China Bond Insurance Corp. Um, while uh, the key thing to look out here is the collateral required. Uh, and we've seen that um, for this round of issuance, the loan to value ratio for the collateral has been largely increased. Uh, while China Bond has also um, started to accept assets uh, such as hotel assets, uh, which they use to reject uh, for the, uh, the previous run. Um, and uh, nowadays banks are also discussing with the regulators uh, for their possibility to uh, directly purchase the developers onshore or offshore uh, bonds in the secondary market. Um, but um, the collateral will also likely be needed for the bonds that could be repurchased. And uh, to look at the third arrow, which refers to the equity financing, uh, we've seen that the CSRC have added a couple of measures to expand the equity financing for the real estate companies. Um, that includes the measures of allowing publicly listed property company to refinance via non-public means. 
uh, while the capital raised can also be used to replenish their working capital and repaying debt. Um, we also see the regulators are allowing the extra listed companies um, to resume the financing under the same guidance for the domestically listed companies, et cetera. Um, and uh, for the fourth arrow, which uh, we'll be re referring to the onshore guarantee for the offshore loans, uh, recently we've seen that Longfeng had received um, 700 million RMB from Bank of China, Hong Kong. And yesterday there was also a news report about Country Garden receiving about um, 300 million um, guarantee for their um, offshore loans. Um, so um, <clears throat> the banks were actually instructed to provide the offshore loans to developers, um, which means the onshore banks will provide the guarantee for the developer's offshore entity, while the offshore financial institutions will help to provide a loan to developers. Um, a couple of developers on the list now include um, CP Holdings, Country Garden, Longform Group, um, Medea Real Estate, and Season Development. And uh, the list can go longer after um, the, the issuance by the Country Garden and Longform Guarantee. Um, later, I'm uh, talking about the 16-point rescue plan. So um, the PBOC and the CBIRC had issued a notice for the rescue plan to help stabilize the real estate market. Um, so it's noted that uh, um, they're encouraged for a stable supply for the real estate development loans with the equal treatment for the private companies and the state-owned companies. Um, and also the regulators have pointed out that um, there should be reasonable support of extension for the developers existing financings, such as the development loans and the trust loans. And they're also encouraging the credit uh, enhancement institution to provide the guarantee support for the real estate companies and um, also encourage the financial institutions to provide an um, extra financing support and um, that can go into the category of uh, development loans or uh, more credit lines, which we've already seen that during the first arrow program. And uh, for the upcoming Central Economic Work Conference, which is happening around um, December 15th, um, the market is expecting uh, a further loosening of the stance um, on the property policy to reverse the downward trend in the, sec uh, in the sector. Um, and we're expecting uh, the regulators will uh, shift the future growth um, from containing the sectors uh, and the deleveraging the sector um, into uh, satisfaction of the housing needs of the consumers. Uh, so um, the market is ex expecting more uh, uh, supporting policies from the regulator for the conference this week. Um, and lastly, on the COVID measures, uh, while China has shifted its COVID policy and reopened itself to boost the consumption and the economy, um, it will be interesting to see whether the housing sales can be stimulated. Um, but um, one thing to notice is that during the first or the second month of the reopening uh, uh, with the significant rate of the infected individuals, um, personal consumption and the, uh, the needs to purchase the houses is likely to drop for a while um, before rebounding uh, for a better uh, sales metrics. Um, so I will pass uh, the rest of how the policy has affected the markets and the bonds to my colleague, Anna. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so uh, I'll be talking about some of the developers um, who have benefited from uh, some of the recent policy changes and uh, the, the, the market reaction uh, so far, which has been really positive. 
Um, so I'll be talking about mostly the second arrow, the, the bond is new issues, and the third arrow, the um, uh, the equity financing uh, aspect. So it's, those are the two um, main ones that have really sort of riled up the market. Uh, so for the new bond issues on shore uh, with China bond insurance guarantees, we've seen um, long four and season obviously have uh, completed their issues. Um, Country Garden, which has another uh, thing from the, the previous quota, they need to make an issuance on that. And we have reported they're applying for um, additional shelf registration quota as well. Uh, I think for for us, um, some of the, the, the people we've been talking to, it's uh, encouraging to see uh, companies like Agile and KWG uh, are making sort of active moves to uh, apply and KWG has uh, completed their registration and we've reported that a company aims to issue the uh, median term notes as soon as this month. Um, so uh, KWG obviously had previously extended their offshore notes. Um, so it's uh, positive for the market to see that and in, in addition to uh, the, the, the good names of long form and season, there are uh, additional developers that are joined to, to, be, to sort of benefit from the recent policy changes. Um, we've seen uh, Shanghai Securities Daily yesterday reported um, Jim Dow and Sifi and uh, China uh, Wankua also will very soon apply for shelf registration quota. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, we see in general uh, they're trying to restructure their offshore liabilities, and they mentioned in an announcement today that they might do uh, apply for uh, 3 billion uh, quota as well and in, in terms of medium term notes. Um, so we will, uh, my, my colleague Catherine will come back to uh, the sort of the, the, the question of whether or not these are aspirational um, deals or they can actually materialize. But I think in general, uh, market reads it as a very positive uh, kind of movement. Um, in terms of this third uh, arrow, equity financing, uh, we've seen at least two directions that things are pulling. Uh, so one direction is uh, CFI obviously is trying to talk, talk to um, state-owned enterprises to try to sell the company's priority shares. So that's one way to do it. The other way is um, obviously, since November 28th, the, the CSRC has lifted the ban. Um, a share companies can now uh, raise equity uh, to to um, help with their liquidity issues. So we've seen Shimao and uh, China Fortune Land. Um, these two, including these two, I think there are 15 companies that are, made announcement that they're trying to do uh, placements. Uh, but Shima and CFLD are the ones that sort of stood out for me because they uh, have been in trouble for a while. Um, again, we'll see if these will pan out for them, but at least it's um, it, it shows sort of a, a positive movement in a really long time. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the bond and the share price is all went up. Quite a quite a bit since I think mid November when the 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 policy news started to come out. Um, Country Gardens, um, one of their I think the 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 eight the eight percent uh, to twenty four notes I think today was in the mid seventies. Uh, I think that went from uh, the end of October and uh, fourteen cents on the dollar. So that's over 60 points um, in a little over a month. Uh, and the, the, the rest all went up. Um, but one thing we would uh, point out is that the impact on, in, uh, on some of the defaulted names. Um, so for example, on 
uh, uh, ten, general. We uh, checked the, the the price movement. There isn't much, and sort of um, the the impact has been muted, relatively muted, uh, in two, in comparison to uh, Long Four and Country Garden. Um, the other names, um, Shimao and uh, I think even Evergrande and Kaiza also see some upward movement, but relatively uh, limited. Um, onshore credits, obviously, as um, all had uh, rallied, and even the ones that has ex extended their um, their maturities have seen really positive upward movements. Um, so I'll um, hand it back to Catherine to talk about um, some of the the issues that we we might be seeing from recent policy changes. Thanks, Anna. <clears throat> um, so in, in terms of the concerns or how effective the policy will be, um, so first question will be, um, so how much of the policies will actually materialize? Um, so the policies are still at the early stage of the implementation and uh, the real effect on the support for the developers are still waiting to be monitored. Um, so one thing is um, after we've seen that um, the state-owned banks and the commercial banks providing the international, uh, international credit line support quarter to the developers, um, so that doesn't mean the developers can actually receive the quarter amount and the loan withdrawal process would um, afterwards is still pending the bank's risk control review and the specific project application. Um, so that's one of the issues. And the other issue is, um, for example, for the MTN shelf registration quarter, and the quota actually itself doesn't all mean that the issuer can successfully issue the uh, these amounts of notes. So it will still depend on the negotiations of the collateral and whether it can find enough investor um, to subscribe for the notes. And one thing to note is that the public funds nowadays would have limited appetite uh, for the real estate bond, um, and banks are likely to be the, uh, most of the buyers. Um, so it's more um, seems to be a political task uh, for the issuance of the notes. Um, but we don't know that how long the issuance can last and whether they can issue um, all of the amounts under the shelf registration quota. And uh, another issue here is that without a significant sales recovery, um, how is the real estate company resolve their uh, long-term funding needs? Um, so the current um, policy is mostly around their financing activity. Um, so that can help the property developer to deal with their uh, maturing debt pressure in the short term. Um, but long-term wise, um, whether the developers can survive would still depend on their sales collectibles, uh, which could contribute to their operating activity cash flows. Um, but the current data for November still shows that uh, the sales are still at a lower level um, with about 34% um, year over year drop um, for the top 50 developers on average. Um, but uh, with the COVID measures loosening in China and the uh, new policies upcoming, uh, we expect the sector will have uh, improving trends, but it will still remain uncertain how quickly it can happen um, for the sales to rebound um, in the future. And um, now we're also looking at the economic slowdown and the aging population. Um, my colleague Anna can talk a little bit more about um, how this uh, structural issues would 
um, falling with the property sector. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I think just adding to what um, Catherine just said, um, the <clears throat> the sales recovery comes down to um, whether or not people are able and willing to buy houses. And um, based on sort of the information that the headlines we're reading and the information that we're, see we're seeing, um, uh, neither of these things are looking that they're recovering very soon. Um, so this is not something that um, that can undo the damages uh, is is difficult to undo overnight with sort of a few short term policy fixes. Um, that's one thing. The other thing people are sort of worried that these things are because next year um, in the first quarter of 2023, um, there are a lot of maturities for developers and both onshore and offshore. Um, so the danger is for people to worry that the government wants to sort of use these short term things to kind of paper over. So let's get through the maturity peak. And then once we get through that, you know, we don't worry about the sort of the root causes and the problems that are underneath. Um, so not the fundamental um, has not changed. Um, so that will give people pause in terms of how these um, policy shifts will fundamentally change the, the future development. Um, the um, COVID, um, uh, the COVID policy change is definitely a, a positive. Um, despite the sort of a spike of cases recently, but, you know, usually people um, had expected that sales will eventually um, pick up if you know the market is open. I think for for economic slowdown and there are non-COVID related issues. There are you know the sort of geopolitical um, issues in other places in the world, and there's the China-U.S. tension in the tech sector. Um, going back to the problem with people's will and ability to, to buy houses and people, you know, if people are not employed, people don't have any income, um, they tend not to buy a house um, and get them into a 30 year debt. Um, so these are sort of issues that I think might need some long-term solutions. And, you know, obviously we're talking about sort of an aging population that and was very high, relatively high, I think 20% somewhere this year use unemployment. Um, so we're, I think some of the worries around the sector is just sort of long-term uh, economic and structural issue that cannot be addressed by a few just uh, policy fixes. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Anna. Um, for those um, in the audience who joined us after we started, um, you are watching the latest installment of the Rework webinar series. We are talking about China's recent stimulus policies, its implications for the China real estate sector, and what it means for investors and what to look out for in the near future. And I'm Shasha Dai, I'm a managing editor who leads the China coverage on our Asia Core credit team. Joining us are two of my colleagues, Catherine Shi is a China editor, Anna Jung is senior China reporter, both Catherine and I have been covering the market for some time, well-versed in all the major credits. And um, we are very um, happy to answer um, any questions you may have. We just ended the prepared presentation. Um, and a reminder, a replay of this webinar with, together with the slides will be available within 24 hours to after the webinar ends to reorg um, subscribers. Right now, we do have time to take your questions. And those who wish to um, ask a question can type in your questions in the Q&A widget located at the bottom of your screen. Um, I have first question coming in 
um, the amount of financing companies have applied under the first or second arrow so far seems relatively small compared with the total financing needs of the companies. How helpful will the new policies be to improving the company's liquidity? So we're talking about um, the, the size of the financing and how helpful is it to uh, solving companies' uh, uh, liquidity problems. Um, um, Catherine, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure, Shasha. Um, so, um, yeah, so the amount of financing provided to the companies, um, it does seem limited uh, compared to the total um, debt maturities of the company. Um, but like I said, um, the financing is, current financing is mostly uh, used to help alleviate um, the short-term debt pressure of the company. And um, in the long term, it still relies on um, how the real estate developer um, can use their sales collect uh, collectibles to um, enlarge their operating activity cash flows. Um, so in the long term, it really just depends on um, the sales of the company. And the current uh, financings, uh, I think the most significant thing is um, one is to um, help the company to extend their maturity profile in terms of the development loans and the trust loans. Um, and on the other front, um, the additional onshore financing can help to boost um, the market's confidence in the credit. Um, so I think it's a more symbolic way and uh, uh, more um, short-term support. Great. Um, there's another question who just uh, which just came in. Um, most of the financing applied under the third arrow is subject to approval by China Securities Regulatory Commission or CSRC. And how will CSRC decide which companies get to issue shares and which ones don't? In what ways will the government pick winners and losers? Um, uh, Anna or Catherine, um, take it away. Um, so I can ask, uh, answer the first question here. So um, I think for the CSRC, um, if a company wants to issue uh, new shares um, for the Asian market, um, it usually takes um, three to six months because um, it will need to get the approval from uh, the, the board of the shareholders. And then it will need to get the permission from the CSRC. So the whole process is taking about three to six months. Um, but for some developer who already have uh, the um, permission of the issuance of additional shares, uh, it can um, be largely quicker, such as like um, season holdings. Um, they already have the quota and the quota has an expiration date of one year, as long as they um, issue before the expiration date, it's going to take um, a lot less of time compared to other developers who doesn't have the permission. And um, I'm not sure how CSRC uh, would pick the winners and losers uh, because I don't, um, I can't speak on the behavior of the regulators. But uh, one thing to remain for sure is that um, for the current policies, um, it's definitely like um, more beneficial who, uh, for the central enterprise first and then for the um, state-owned enterprise later. And um, then for the private enterprise who have good financial standings. And then it was um, the developers um, who have not defaulted and um, have, um, but with um, worse financial standing, but good um, project qualities. And lastly would be the developers who have already extended their debt. Um, so that's um, kind of a sequence of how the policy would beneficial all these different kinds of developers. Okay. Yeah, that, that list of priorities is definitely helpful. Um, I wonder, Anna, do you have anything to add to, um, to what Catherine has just um, said to the question? 
Uh, no, I was. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I agree. I, I think uh, the the season part is that I meant to mention it in my part is that they seem to be uh, one of the the uh, the private owned developers that will mostly benefit from the this third arrow. Um, so because they already gone through the, the approval process and they just need the board to, to approve it. Okay. All right. Um, I have a follow-up question to that, but uh, let's address this um, this from the audience. The next question, as for or domestic guarantee for offshore loans, which banks have received the incentives or the, I guess, the, the directives to do that? And how is it decide which companies get to apply for such a guarantee? Who wants to take this one? Catherine, you want to go first? Um, so I think um, the banks are, the banks who have received the notification includes Bank of China, um, construct, uh, Construction Bank, um, ICBC, and the Agriculture Bank of China. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, the companies now on the list would include uh, like CFI, Long Fong, Country Garden, Madea Real Estate, and uh, Madea Real Estate and Season Development. So uh, if you look at the, the list, it's quite similar to uh, what's the, the list of the second arrow, which, um, it, which was the second arrow Pro, uh, list back in September when CV has not defaulted yet, uh, has not defaulted offshore yet. Um, and um, so the list of developers can still expand in the future. And, um, but I think the, the main target is those developers um, who have more uh, upcoming offshore maturities and the developers who have a more significant um, impact on the overall sector, such as country garden, um, that which um, the regulator certainly doesn't want it to default very easily. Otherwise, it will cause many um, society problems um, onshore. Um, the other developers would also include um, names like Longfong Group or Banke, which um, certainly has a better financial standing and just need a little bit of help to boost market confidence in the credits. Okay. Um, the follow-up question that I had in mind, and, and Anna was actually circling back to your slide and talking about company and market reactions, is in the, the third arrow uh, program, the beneficiaries that we've noticed, as you mentioned during your presentation, that included companies like Shimao and, and China Fortuneland that had been in the have, been in trouble for a while. You know, for Shimao and the CFLD to flow these A-share placement plans, what does that mean? Um, in other words, if I were an equity investor, how would I look at that share placement plans and convince myself that's actually a good investment to make. Do you have any um, thoughts or color on that one? Um, so these are, um, so those, these companies made the announcement. They haven't actually been able to do that. Um, so those are what I would call aspirational announcements. <laughs> they, they don't necessarily um, lead into an actual deal. Um, as Catherine mentioned, the the, um, the the actual deal will need the approval of the government and the board and the various sort of go through the various hoops and you can get it done and it takes quite a while. Um, so I I think these uh, both Shanghai Shima and the CFLD have been uh, in trouble for a while. I think Shanghai Shima uh, just, uh, so that's the onshore subsidiary of Shima Group. So they are trying to do a, an onshore restructuring of all their um, uh, bonds as well. Um, so they might want to signal to investors that um, 
you know, they too can um, get some benefit from the, the policies. Um, but I don't know if your, your questions are very good ones. I don't know if investors would consider in either of these, these companies a good choice. Um, as I said, I think the, the, the largest benefit, uh, the companies uh, that will most benefit from this scheme tend to be the, the, the quality ones, the seasonals, the mm-hmm. downs. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, One of the questions that I got uh, quite frequently from offshore investors is that, you know, which credit should they be looking out for who will most likely benefit from the loosening or these uh, stimulus policies? Um, Catherine or Anna, I don't know if we could name names, but um, are there certain attributes that we should be looking out for, certain pockets of the policy, certain pockets of the sector, certain, you know, names um, that we should be looking out for, who will most likely benefit from uh, these policies? Catherine, maybe you want to take that one. Mm, I don't think there's uh, like uh, certainly like the one who mostly benefits from the policy. Um, but I, I think the uh, credits that can be looked out for is um, first is the company that still has better financial standing, like long form uh, or season. Um, and we can also look at the credits um, that has better commercial assets because um, China bond insurance now. Uh, wants better collateral and they usually require the commercial assets collateral and um, in terms of the uh, like the potentially banks buyback of the offshore notes or the onshore bonds in the secondary market um, banks are also requiring those bonds um, would need a uh, collateral underneath it um, so I think we should mostly look at those two different credits and also um one thing to consider, I think, is the credit that has a very big significance to the China's property market, like Country Garden, um, because um, I think the policy can still um, be ongoing for a while, and, um, and the regulators, if they want to save the sector, they will save the ones that has a better significance to boost the, uh, the market. Um, and uh, some of the perception I get from the market is that country cards can also be um, too big to fail after Evergrande. Um, but I'm not sure if this is going to be the fact after a couple of months, but uh, I think certainly it's worth looking at, uh, worth looking out for credits like those. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. That's a super helpful. And and uh, just to, on the back of that, Country Garden is one name in particular that we at Rework has been following for a while. Um, we actually started looking more closely at this name since at least a year ago. So a very nice arc of a coverage on that name. And that's certainly one of many that we are continue to um, monitor closely. Uh, I've got one more question uh, coming. Um, if the government is serious about giving up the insistence of housing is for living in, not for speculation, what does that mean for the deleveraging process? Is that the beginning? of another property bubble. Um, who wants to take this one? Catherine, do you want to kick us um, off? Sure. Um, so if we look at the slogan of housing is for living, not for speculation, that had the uh, repeated by multiple political bureau meeting in the past few years, um, but if we look at the most recent political um, meeting, it doesn't uh, mention the slogan again. So that's a signal that the regulators might um, be thinking that the, the deleveraging process have come to the end. Um, but um, I think um, more importantly now for regulators is to save the sector or at least maintain the stability of the sector. Otherwise, um, there will be more um, payouts to the economy. 
um, the property bubble. Um, I think one thing is that uh, the housing price in multiple cities, um, basically all cities except Shanghai, it has um, the housing price has gone down, um, and uh, the mm, the key thing for the regulators is not allowing the housing price to go up too much, but also not to go down too much, as they want to maintain a balance in the market. Um, uh, since that the housing price have gone down a lot, um, I think the main concern for them is to maintain the stability and prevent the housing price to continue to drop. So uh, I don't really think there's an issue about housing bubble now, but the more important thing is to maintain the balance of the housing price and also to um, kind of sell, save or bail out the property sector. Great. Thank you, Catherine. I see no further questions coming in. Um, let me just first double check. And again, you are watching the, the actually our last webinar for the year for the from the Asia Core Credit team. Um, we just talk about the implications of China's latest policy stimulus for the real estate sector and investors. Um, as a reminder, Reorg is a global provider of credit intelligence, data analytics for law firms, investors, and advisors. If you're already a subscriber, please send any remaining questions to customer success at reorg.com. And remember a replay with the, the slides will be available on the Reorg webinar and podcast page within two working days. A big thank you for everyone who joined us today, as well as to our panelists, Catherine and Anna. Thank you everyone. Have a great evening.